All right, yes, now we can see it. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Sorry about that. No okay. Problem. So, um, thank you, Omar. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Um, so the webinar today is going to uh, cover manual gene annotation um, using the Apollo system. And this builds on some of the previous webinars that you may or may not have uh, uh, attended in with in relating to uh, the genome browser, the new genome browser that's going to be used, um, JBrowse, and uh, David Roos's uh, analysis of RNA-seq data to look at the validity of gene models. And, uh, and obviously today we're going to talk a bit about how, if those do not look correct, how we can go about trying to change those um, to make improvements on the uh, canonical reference gene set for a particular species. Um, so I've got a few slides just to go over about what annotation actually is, and then we'll dive into the Apollo inter interface and uh, do some navigation, um, show how you can uh, turn tracks on, turn tracks off, interpret those tracks, and how to actually make edits. So the first thing to notice here that there's that the support for manual annotation in, in ViewPathDB is at the moment a, a work in progress. Um, we're still moving towards getting this rolled out for the beta release when that will be available in the next couple of weeks. And initially, this will just be hosting the arthropod genomes that the legacy BRC3 vector base actually hosted. So we're just emulating what was previously there in the last round of funding. And then we'll expand that out to include uh, genomes from all the other component databases, so all the parasite genomes, trypanosomes, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, and again, the initial implementation uh, that we want to talk about today and will be available with the beta release is purely about structural annotation. Uh, by structural annotation, I mean changing the exon intron boundaries of a gene model. Okay, so it's not about adding functional annotation. Functional annotation is giving um, product descriptions, adding uh, go terms, uh, adding XREFs to uh, other databases you might be interested in or PubMed IDs, etc. So functional annotation will come later and that will be the focus of a subsequent webinar um, once that's in place. Uh, as I said, more genomes will be added with future releases and at that point as well, we'll make better integration with the main site, e.g. have links from each individual gene page into Apollo at the correct location so you can work uh, on that particular locus rather than how to navigate that at the moment. The aims of the manual annotation uh, in ViewPathDB would be to develop a, a single one-stop shop for manual annotation of both structural and functional annotation that would be used by the community and directed by ViewPathDB staff uh, who have uh, a remit of doing curation. Um, so that means that the, the tools will be the same whether you're uh, a member of staff or whether you're a member of the community. And so that transparency hopefully allows us to, to answer any questions that you may have about how it works because we're using it as well. Um, but also it means that as we develop things as a, as a single unified way of seeing all of these things. Um, the, the goal really is to support the modification of gene predictions for species where that might be um, useful. Um, that could be because there's a, there's, a, there's a pressing need to improve the quality of those. Um, but for other species, the annotations may be already in a, in a good enough state that we don't need to do any work on them. And for some species, of course, you know, we, we actually don't want to be changing those things, such as, you know, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. There are other people who are responsible for that kind of work. So this means the ability to create novel predictions, predictions that don't currently exist in the reference set, to modify existing um, predictions, that's the, the, the meat and bones of this, where things are obviously wrong, either in terms of uh, the protein coding, CDS sequences, or also in terms of the untranslated regions, the UTRs, maybe transcription start sites, et cetera. And under some circumstances, we want to have the ability to remove predictions where there is no evidence that these are actually real, um, and they, they are thought to be artifacts of the initial um, annotation process. So following on from that, the, the, you need to be able to actually see where annotations have been changed. So you need to see modified predictions. 
So those will be made available in the genome browser um, as soon as practical uh, uh, inside of the JBrowse uh, so people can see when there have been updates and uh, act accordingly if you want to, to interact with that in terms of maybe designing primers or, or looking at a modified uh, um, protein sequence. We would like to make regular updates to the, the reference canonical gene set and prioritize based on uh, the community interest, uh, the volume of data that actually uh, needs to be processed and the time since the last update. This sounds in some ways quite woolly, but essentially it means if there are more people interested in working on a particular genome, that will be updated more regularly. If there are a large number of uh, edits to be processed, again, that will be um, updated more regularly. Um, and if there's something that we haven't done and it hasn't been updated for, shall we say, over a year, then that also we put on the list. So there's some flexibility in terms of update schedule, but uh, the idea is to do it as, as frequently as we possibly can, given the amount of uh, um, effort that we can put into this. Obviously, updates to functional annotations will happen on a more frequent basis. Um, they do not have the same cost in terms of processing, um, and it's more important that those get pushed out as soon as possible. Uh, just a quick so, note, uh, Dan, sorry. Um, just to say, with functional annotation, if people want to integrate this kind of information, we still have uh, user comments available. Uh, so people can use those to add functional annotation. Yes, thank you, Dave. So, so that, that's very true. This is this is, will be a replacement for some of those systems, but those systems will be in place until it is rolled out. So you can continue to use user comments. You can continue to send help desk messages um, to the app, to the curators, and they will they will make those edits on your behalf as as they normally do at the moment. So um, from my point of view, who, as a person who's been doing annotation for, for many years, um, the structural annotations are, are underpin a large number of the, the downstream um, data representations that we see. Um, so this is just a, a picture to remind myself that uh, structural predictions are the basis for all of the orthology pyrology um, annotations that happen. They are then the key to whether you, to making gene expression metrics. They're also the key to doing the, the consequences of variant SNPs. So for some species, it's very important to try and get these models correct. Okay. So initially, the first pass annotation system is usually done not by a manual approach. It's done by a, by a, a, a workflow of various bioinformatics tools that will try and predict genes. Um, these are based on two types of approach. One, the ab initio. This means not using any, any more information other than just the sequence itself. So there is, uh, uh, because of the constraints of the genetic code, you can tell the difference between um, coding sequences versus non-coding sequences, and you can write algorithms to try and predict genes based on that, the composition essentially of the DNA. Second approach is to use existing information from other species or directly from your own species in terms of express sequence, BSTs, RNA-seq, et cetera, to do a similarity type approach, okay? So those, are, those, those analyses are run, uh, a set of genes are predicted, um, but in many cases, there are, there are systematic problems in those uh, um, prediction algorithms, or new information comes to light that means you need to change and, and update those gene models. Okay. So that could, could be rerun as an algorithm again, or it could be done in a manual way where you focus on specific loci or specific types of problems. And the three things to remember here really is, one, that the, the annotation set that's given to you that you can access via databases such as ViewPathDB is not necessarily 100% correct, okay? It's not Moses coming down from the mountain saying this is how it is. You should always have some skepticism about the, the annotations. If you're going to spend some time to, um, designing oligos or you're gonna spend some money in the lab, always check those gene predictions before you go forward. Don't just assume they are correct. Um, the process of annotation is not just about hitting a, a button and it magically happens. 
there's lots of things that happen inside of there. There are lots of checks and balances that need to be looked at. Um, but this is not rocket science. You know, it, it is accessible to people and you can um, get involved and improve the quality of the annotations. So what kind of problems do we really see here? Um, uh, essentially, a lot of this is about the quality of the assembly. You can use an analogy of an assembly as being sort of a jigsaw puzzle, where you go from a poor assembly where there are lots of pieces missing to a good assembly to a complete assembly where everything's in place and everything is, is looking completely correct. And inside of those different assemblies, the problems you might have with gene annotations are, are missing or missed predictions. So missing a prediction means that you just don't have the, the, the representation of the assembly in that region. So this would be like a poor assembly. You won't be able to find those genes in the data set because it just don't exist because data is not there. Missed predictions are the data is there, but the annotations don't exist. Okay? Um, the more fragmented a genome is, in terms of its assembly, the more likely you are to have genes that straddle between two scaffolds i.e. they've been split artifactually because the data is not contiguous. Um, there are examples of where loci can be either split or merged uh, in the annotation process. Uh, again, some of those are, are systematic to the uh, algorithms, and they are especially prevalent where you have tandemly arrayed gene families, where there are multiple copies of very similar genes next to each other that, that tend to, for, to tend to make these algorithms go wrong. Um, you can have missing exons, you can have incorrect splice junctions, you can have parcel predictions as well. So these are all the kinds of, of errors that uh, are found in first pass automatic annotations that we can use manual approaches to try and correct. So the priorities for those annotations could be looking for missed predictions, um, could be trying to drive up the accuracy of those predictions, making sure that uh, all of the exon intron boundaries are supported with evidence um, and, and corrected. Um, you might want to look at transcript diversity. In this sense, I mean, um, for some of the species inside of UPATH, there is very prevalent uh, alternate isoforms. And some of these alternate isoforms will have, will have mean, um, will have consequences of changing the, the coding sequence. And so those are very important to try and get hold of. Um, but other ones might just be about changes to the transcription start site that might not have at the moment any biological relevance or that it could have. Um, but there's a lot of data out there that you could try and make sure that you get the right start sites um, and then associate that with particular expression patterns or control regions. And the, the fourth one to think about is, is whether you have gene families, we have gain and loss of, of uh, uh, members of gene families. So you can have expansions of particular gene families in response to some sort of uh, external stimulus. Um, from a, an arthropod mosquito point of view, um, we see things like that where um, detoxification genes are, are, you have a gain of the, the copy number in a, in a gene that's responsible for detoxification against an insecticide. So those are important to try and um, identify and annotate inside of your assemblies. In terms of strategies, you can think of this as in two ways. You can think of, of doing a, a paint a bridge style approach where you start at one end of a chromosome and walk all the way to the other end. So this is very comprehensive, but it's very slow to deal with problem genes and, and updates are very uh, infrequent. Or you can think of it in terms of uh, painting a picture where it's like painting by numbers and you identify a particular type of problem um, and then you generate a list of that uh, problem loci in your genome via some sort of script and then you can then you can go away ahead and uh, correct those um, en masse so to speak so this is responsive to the community um, but it's only as good as your ability to find things that are wrong to give you a sort of idea of of, uh, of what our experience has been in the brc3 from the arthropod genomes um, so this is uh, from about 34 species over the last five years with about 50 active users 60% um, of the changes are relatively minor. They're just changing uh, exon intron boundaries or adding uh, UTRs. About 20% have been splits or merge events, uh, with the majority being splits. And uh, about 20% have been uh, generation of new novel annotations or deletions of old ones. Okay. So the whole, all of those uh, um, different kind of classifications are, are possible uh, and can be had and can be performed using Apollo. 
Um, so the majority of things are, are not viewed as being particularly major. That's what I'm trying to um, emphasize. Um, okay, so then ways in which we would like to try and if you're going to make changes, you have to ensure that your changes are, are positive. Um, and so you will continue to make metrics against these gene sets to try and see improvement between different releases and to ensure that uh, any annotations that are happening are uh, beneficial. So these can be simple things like simple statistics, um, you know, whether you're finding uh, starts and stops, uh, the length and number of exons, uh, especially these can be generated via uh, comparative analyses with RNA-seq data, which is essentially, you know, expression, um, or author logs to uh, where other genomes that have been annotated or are well annotated. So this is just a list of, uh, of a number of different kinds of metrics you might want to run on those gene sets. So where we currently want to talk about today is, is Apollo. So Apollo is a, a collaborative real-time um, genome annotation web-based editor. It's part of the GMOD project, uh, which is the genetic, generic model organism database project. It's a web application that runs in your browser as a JBrowse plugin. Um, we use OAuth uh, access delegation to the existing ViewPath DB user accounts. And all the evidence track data is sourced via web services from the core databases. So what does this mean to you as a user? It means that it should work in your favorite web browser. There's no code needs to be installed. Um, it just should work out of the box. Uh, there's no new login or accounts that need to be uh, signed up for. Um, for those people who uh, are aware of the vector-based system, we never actually got this in place. And so there was a separate set of authentication for Apollo as opposed to vector-based. In ViewPathDB, this will not be the case, and so your existing ViewPathDB login should just work. You'll still have to log in, but it will be the same um, credentials. And there's synchronization of data and the interface with the ViewPathDB genome browser. So again, the JBrowse instance that you can access as part of the main gene pages and the main site, all of those data tracks will have exactly the same names and be exactly the same data inside of Apollo as it is inside of um, JBrowse in the main site. So just in the bottom right hand corner here, I've just put a, a link to uh, the la latest um, publication on Apollo, um, uh, where you can find out more details about what they're doing, their development path, um, and how other, other people are actually using that. So, any questions at that point, Omar et al? Uh, nothing right now. I think uh, you can keep going. Thanks. Cool. So this is just, I'm just now going to a web browser. This is uh, the homepage for the beta release, not quite out yet, Vectorbase. This is just to show that access to Apollo will be via this tools menu. And you can see it's the first option in this drop down menu here that says Apollo. And that will take you to a page that looks something like this. I'll get rid of that. Okay, so this is, for those people who are familiar with JBrowse, it will look like JBrowse. It is essentially JBrowse, it's a plugin. Um, and so the main things to note here is there's uh, navigation inside of here. You have, you have uh, the drop down menus at the top, which are about uh, configuring and uh, moving around inside of the Apollo, or sorry, JBrowse. You have a representation of uh, the entirety of the contig that you're currently looking at here so there's a there's a little red marker to show which part of the contig you're looking at and you have coordinate systems this is uh, a, a chromosome arm 2l from anopheles gambi so it's about 45 uh, megabases in size it's quite large um, so for those who, are, who understand from navigation in jbrowse it'll be very familiar you have move left move right you can zoom in and out depending on a large scale or a small scale change. You can change which uh, scaffold contig you're looking at, and you get uh, an information about where you currently are looking at. So in this case, you can see the coordinates start and stop where you are seeing. Uh, further things that are in, involved here is there's an ability to highlight regions. So you can highlight a region that will change its, well, so it's moving it a bit. Let's zoom out again. Okay, that's 
not working the way I was expecting, but okay. Should highlight things. Uh, we can turn off track names um, and we can filter out some smaller reads. So the main system then that you see here is, it says moving back, we have two different parts of the display. You have a region at the top, which is a track called user created annotations, which is highlighted in the background color of yellow. That is where we're going to do um, interactive work inside of Apollo in terms of making genes and changing gene models. Then in the, in the white uh, panel below, essentially is, is, the, is a genome browser and it will have various evidence tracks turned on you can then uh, interact with. There we go, it's a bit slow, but we'll do it. So you can see in this case, I've got four tracks turned on at the moment. One is the, the actual annotated transcripts. One is RNA-seq evidence for introns. Um, and then there's, there's forward and reverse uh, RNA-seq reads aligned to the genome. Okay. So, on the right hand side, there are two buttons here which open up separate panels. So essentially we're going to try and show that there's three panels that we can start working with. So the first one gives you an annotators panel on the right hand side, which gives you again more information about which species you're looking at um, and which contig you're looking at at the moment. So if I click on the species, you'll see you get a drop down menu allows you to to change to a different species if you want to interact and edit uh, not enough use can be but a, a different uh, species uh, there are three uh, tabs here one is the annotations which we'll come back to but essentially this is a list of all annotations that are inside of apollo that allows you to interact with them and and see navigate between them so when we make a prediction it will appear in this in this uh, tab uh, there's one for tracks so this shows all of the available tracks evidence tracks you can turn on. So again, we can see here, I've turned on the annotated transcripts, I've turned on the RNA-seq evidence, but there are other ones available to me. Um, and for those who are more eagle-eyed, you'll see that the majority of data here is actually comes from transcriptomics. This is all RNA-seq uh, experiments that have been aligned back to the genome. In this case, there's 772 of them. And you can scroll down and try and find things there. Final tab in this annotated panel is, is a ref sequence. So reference sequences, it tells you a list of all the reference sequences. You can navigate between them by clicking on the name. Um, it tells you the length and it tells you the number of annotations that have been performed on that, uh, that reference. And again, we'll come back to that once you actually change uh, an annotation. The other button here is, is this for showing JBrowse track selector. This will force a, a, a reload, but it will make a new panel on the left-hand side, which then reiterates all the available tracks, but in a way that's a little bit more easy to uh, interact with. So now you can see again, this is going to be the same as the tracks that are available here, but I actually have the ability to filter tracks by their name or, or by their type. So I can only see any coverage plots for all of the RNA-seq etc okay so three panels one to to uh um interact and turn facts on and off one to actually do the main work and one to give some summaries of those data so let's go back i'm going to just make that a little bit smaller and turn off the symphony for some speed okay so as I said, this is a minimum minimum we have here. I'm not I have not gone through all of the various that tracks that are available. Again, that is synchronized with the tracks that are available inside of JBrowse. So if you you can either look at them here or you can look at them in the main site. Um, what I want to quickly go through here now is about how we interact with with these uh, these tracks, how we would go about making a, an edit to a gene model. So first off. Um, as I say, these tracks are all configurable. So once you've turned them on, you can highlight uh, the track and there's a drop down menu at the end that allows you to give more information about the track. You can uh, pin it to the top. So it's always the one that's very at the, at the very top of your screen and you have the ability to collapse or show the labels. So obviously that takes a label away, um, put it back, uh, collapsing 
literally does that. So it means that you, you, you reduce the amount of screen space that's being used by the track. Um, again, when we find some tracks that have a large, much larger amount of data, you can see how that would be beneficial um, or not. Uh, these are also interactable, so we can interact with a, a feature from the introns. I can find out more details about this. So this again, if, if for those people that were, were around for the webinar on how to use RNA Seq, this gives you all the information about uh, the alignments and uh, mapping of this intron, how many times reads actually span the intron, which gene it, it actually aligns to, and then its representation and frequency count inside of all of the different uh, experiments that you will find that mapping. So this is a very uh, well uh, supported intron, as we can see. If we click on the gene model, we do the same uh, control mouse button to try and get the Z menu up. Um, we can see the details. So we can find, again, summary information about the species, the ID, uh, where the coding sequence and the UTRs are. And there are link outs from here to OrthoMCL, to the um, OrthoMCL cluster group of orthologs, or to the main site to a specific gene page. So that should, he has, says load. And this will be the, the classic gene page that people are used to in the main site or, or the new, new version of that gene page. Um, that has all the information that is stored inside of ViewPathDB, both in terms of the gene model, uh, the, the curation IDs, uh, orthologs, and synteny information, uh, transcript home information, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So to, to interact with a, a model, you can click on uh, individual exons or you can double click to get the whole model, or you can click inside of an intron to get the whole model. So hopefully people are used to the, the representation where these rectangles are exons, little hats are introns. So if I highlight an entirety of the, the gene by just clicking on it, I then can drag, so put your finger on the mouse and drag it up into this user-created area like this. So if I, drag it to the user created area and let go of it. It will then make that prediction, make that transcript inside the user created annotation set. Um, this is uh, uh, tracked, so you can see the type by default, because this is an mRNA, this is also an mRNA. It tells me who did it, myself, and when it was last modified, okay? If you, if you go from any feature inside of these trackable tracks, it will automatically be named based on that. Otherwise, it will get an, a, a random name based on the location that you're in. So again, if I double click on that to get the whole thing, there's a drop down menu using the control mouse button, which has a number of different options here. And we'll go through some of those. So you can, the first panel is more about information about that prediction. So I can, get the sequence for that for that uh, prediction. That is by default the peptide sequence, but I can change this to cDNA or CDS or genomic. And there's buttons here to, to take that and, and copy that to the clipboard. I'll show you why that might be a useful thing to do later on. Um, I also can see a representation of this uh, model as a GFF file. For those people that want to export this and do something else, you might want to have uh, updated gene models as a GFF to do some or reanalyze the expression data or recall SNPs for their consequences, etc. There's a, um, I can view it back in this annotator panel, it should be over here. So this is a particular gene. So now because we've made a gene in the in the user created annotations area it now shows up within this annotations tab. This is the gene with its name, the sequence, uh, contact that it's, it, it's located on, the type, the length, and the date. And then there's a transcript here as well. And this transcript has a different name because multi, a single gene can have multiple transcripts. Yeah. So I'll show that again. So if I go to this, this uh, model, I highlight the whole thing and do the control. Uh, mouse again. I come down to here, this is the third, the fourth panel down. I'll say duplicate. 
it will make me another version of the, exactly the same um, prediction. So now if I come back here, and I click, you see there's two different transcripts now attached to this gene. It may be identical in terms of prediction, but there's two transcripts. So this is a way in which you can build multiple isoforms um, for particular predictions. The other thing you can do inside of here, which is will become more useful as we move towards capturing functional annotation, is you can edit information. So this is uh, an information editor for that transcript. Um, we can see the name of the gene. We can see that there, there's um, two different isoforms for this. And this allows you to add uh, attributes or PubMed IDs or comments uh, or descriptions or symbols, and anything else you might want to add to this annotation. So I could call this, uh, you know, novel gene and, uh, and give it a, a symbol or a gene name like that. Okay, so that's initiating. You can only initiate a prediction by uh, starting from some evidence. You can't just build a gene from, from scratch. Uh, you have to have something to actually build it from. So that can be uh, modifying an existing um, entry, or it can be taking uh, a feature such as a confirmed intron or a peptide similarity sequence or an EST alignment and start from there. So I can highlight, in this case, this track here is, is RNA-seq evidence for introns. I can highlight as a, a um, an intron, which is represented here as the, the, the flanking exon sequences of that intron, and do exactly the same thing, lift that up into the user-created area. Okay, that's actually good to see here. What you see here is those, these little warning icons come out. What this is telling me is that these are not canonical splice sites. So for a prediction, an intron has a, a canonical set of, of sequences inside of the intron, usually GTAG, or it could be GCAG, and this shows me that it's on the wrong strand, essentially. So these genes, you can see them going from right to left on the reverse strand. This is now being placed on the, on the left to right on the forward strand. So I can resolve that by going to that, this menu again. So you, you click, highlight, control, click, um, and I go to move to opposite strand. And now those, those warning errors disappear. So I can carry on now building that gene model if I wish. I can add exons by highlighting this particular exon. And I lift it up into the user created area. And as long as I'm hovering over the thing I want to add it to, that green box appears. When I let go, the, the model will be changed. So again, I can take an exon and I can add it to the gene just by highlighting, hovering over, letting go, okay? You can also do this by taking uh, introns so I can do exactly the same thing like that. I say, because I know those are in the wrong strands, but it works. And if I want to fill in that exon, highlight, click. Now I'm going to do another option, which is that you highlight a feature. If you go to the edge of that feature, you'll see the little arrow appear. If I do that, I click and hold down and then drag, I can extend feature left or right. So in this case, I'm going to extend feature all the way through so that it overlaps with the other part of the exon. Uh, Dan, yeah. before you go on, there's yeah. uh, a question, I guess there was a question from a, um, an attendee, which I'm going to elaborate on uh, as well. So the, the person was asking whether they can upload their own uh, data tracks. And the answer was obviously, yes, you can do that uh, under um, uh, file and open tracks, and you can open it either from a file that's locally on your machine, or you can you can have it stored somewhere in a URL that you link to, and it will load um, locally. It doesn't upload to our servers; it loads locally on on the browser. The question I wanted to maybe add is whether those features, then, if a, if a, um, a user at, loads their own track of features, can they use those features to start a new annotation or modify an annotation? Yes, they should be able to. Okay. Um, so, so am I correct? You come here, you can go to the file uh, and you do open track file or URL. This allows you to select one from your local machine or, as you said, from a URL. Uh, Apollo will try to uh, guess the file format based on the 
the um, the file extension otherwise you can uh, uh, assign what it actually is uh, and then you upload it into the into the, the browser so again confirm it doesn't actually uh, put that data into viewpath DB database it's only within the session that you'll have opening your web browser at that time so if you close your web browser and come back the next day or after lunch um, that track will have disappeared but you can of course reload it um, and that's true for, for GFF files. It's also true for um, bigwig files uh, of coverage, et cetera, like, like this one down here or something else. Great. And, and uh, also another point of clarification, which comes from another question, and that is, uh, what about the changes to the annotation? Are those stored locally or are they stored on, the, uh, you know, on our servers and, and become you know, part of the modified annotation? So the, the changes to the annotation, so the, this information here is stored on ViewPathDB servers uh, in a separate database instance. Um, and what we do is that, that they're there, um, they're visible to everyone. So if, if, if we all had this window open and, and one person made a change, that would be synchronized with everyone else that's looking at that particular um, coordinate space. Um, but they're, they're stored on our servers and at, at when we decide we're going to try and make an update to that gene set, to that canonical set, we will then process it from that database. So they're not stored locally to you, they are visible to everyone. There's no way to make things privately just to you. Uh, it's, it's collaborative, it's interactive, everyone sees all the changes in real time. Yeah? Great, thank you. Yeah. Okay, let's keep going. Right, so I, we, we can show how to make genes. Um, you obviously, I can, you can zoom in further, and if you zoom in far enough, you will actually see uh, the DNA sequence, like so. And so this shows you the, the forward and reverse uh, DNA nucleotide sequence. Um, it also then shows you six-frame translation, forward and reverse. I usually have the, the, color, the colors turned on, but you can use this view option drop-down menu and you can turn off the colors. So this just shows you the raw DNA, DNA and uh, six-frame translation. It highlights uh, potential initiation methionines. It highlights um, potential stop codons. The advantage of having the colors on is that then there's a correspondence between the frame of the six-frame translation and the exons that you see inside of the, the user-created area. So this tells me this because we know this is a gene that's going from right to left on a reverse strand. This tells me that the frame that's coding here is actually the red one. So I can see that what I'm expecting to see here is S, Y, G, E, Q, et cetera. Okay? So that's an advantage of having the colors turned on. That's, that is the default um, option. So we can make genes. Uh, if you want to delete genes, you can, well, or delete things, you can highlight a, a feature. And again, using that control click to this menu, you can delete particular features. If you want to delete the entirety of a gene, you highlight the whole gene and then say delete. If you're deleting an entire transcript, it will always ask you to confirm that you want to do this. So I'll say yes, and that will disappear. Um, let's see what else we can do here. Um, Drop-down menu also allows you to, to split and merge the different predictions together. Um, it allows you to uh, split uh, or put an intron inside of an exon here by saying make exon so let's try that go here highlight somewhere in the middle and i say make an intron and it will create a new intron feature inside of that exon and i'm going to try and get rid of that one let's skip the whole thing good uh, the other thing to notice is that it will automatically try to assign a, a initiation start methionine um, and, a, and will calculate where the stop is. Coloration again shows you the coding sequence is colored. UTRs are these white boxes. So if we zoom in here, we should be able to see that the first um, codon is a methionine going this way. And if we zoom to the end, should be able to see there's going to be a stop code on here. Yes, this, this asterisk. Okay. In terms of uh, using RNA-seq evidence, I've used these introns, which are generated from the RNA-seq alignments. 
but I also could look at these coverage plots of, of RNA-seq. So I can move uh, evidence tracks up and down by clicking on one and then dragging. So let's remove that one to the top. And so we should be able to zoom in and just confirm that the boundaries between exons and introns are correspond with the alignments of that RNA-seq. So you should be able to see that these things line up here and here. And we should be able to see that the start, this is a canonical intron, so it's GT to AG. Okay. Uh, Dan, so, question. Um, yep. Just when it comes to uh, UTR boundaries, uh, what kind of criteria would you uh, use to define those? So that is an open question. Uh, it's very difficult to um, to come up with a, a good heuristic to that. So the first thing to note there is that the, the, the boundaries, depending on the, the volume of data you have in a particular experiment, you might find different potential boundaries predicted. Um, I would say that uh, it's, it's, I tend to be conservative. Um, I tend to be that making, an intro, making a, a, a UTR is more important than getting the exact start or stop correct. Um, I think if people want to look at uh, potential different transcription starts, then that is uh, you know another 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 thing to try and uh, um, another source of data. There are ways in which you can experimentally try to get transcription starts as opposed to just looking at coverage blocks. But but I, but I would I would I, I stress less about that than getting uh, the prediction coding sequence correct. I think I would say. Do, do your best. It's always best to, to zoom in as close as you can, so you get you don't you don't make an error just in, in terms of because you're looking at it from too far out. And you know, I don't know, Dave. It's it's difficult. I, not not the full extent, but something where you start to see there's there's sufficient data. It will it will change very, very dramatically depending on which data set you're looking at and what you're trying to achieve there. The important thing is to identify whether or not there are splicing in those UTRs. So if you have a spliced UTR, make sure you include you know, every single exon you possibly can. That seems to me to be more important than getting exact uh, coordinate start or stop from this. Uh, again, and, you know, there's no there's no evidence, there's no data here for polyadenylation. So the three prime end is also quite hard to uh, um, assert. Uh, but there, there is no mechanism in Apollo. So, for example, when it comes to uh, pu pushing your annotation into the top uh, to actually uh, utilize the RNA seq data for the UTR prediction, is there? No. You, you basically you have to to look at what that the the coverage plot here, and then just change the boundary by dragging it to where you think that might be. So, you know, you might look at this and say, for this particular data set, that, that would be a, a more appropriate uh, three prime end, or maybe that. There's no there's no heuristics, there's no hard and fast rules that that I am aware of, or, or anyone is really implementing at this stage. Cool. Okay. Right, so quickly, other things that we wanted to show before we move on. Um, so we said we could highlight uh, the whole of a prediction, and then, and then you can use this control click to get the sequence. So you might want to do this to get the peptide sequence, uh, and then you can do copy to clipboard, and maybe go to NCBI and run a blast similarity search. I'm going to do that and then let that run. So obviously in, in this case, um, I have no expectation this will be different from what we expect, but quite often if you're making a prediction change or you're making a, a novel prediction, you want to go back and check against the uh, other databases and all other species. And so this is a, a very uh, a, a very frequently used uh, um, aspect of Apollo, which is you make your prediction changes, you then go and run a uh, search, similarity search at, at BLAST in, in MCBI or potentially at ViewPath, if you want to look at other species that we have here, and then just to confirm whether that looks like it's a, a good match to uh, other known uh, examples of that locus. So in this case here, 
unsurprisingly, the top hit is Anopheles Gambi. Um, and again, it should be a perfect match, you can see. But this would be a way of iteratively making changes and, and checking and comparing against uh, uh, other known uh, species through there. Right, last thing to do before we tidy up is to actually go and just show you quickly how you might want to do this in anger. So I've shown uh, how you, inside of the browser, how you move around, how you interact with things. Obviously, there's no data here that we actually want to make a change that would be um, useful. So this is uh, Rodneus prolixus. It's a kissing bug, um, another species that's supported inside of uh, ViewPathDB. And what I'm going to do here is just highlight a, a region with a prediction. So here we've shown we've got two tracks on, on, on display. One is the um, introns that are matching the annotation. One is the introns that are not matching the annotation that are potentially new and novel. And I want to show you, hopefully you can see that for this particular locus here, RPRC 014336, we have a 4x on gene prediction, and that roughly matches with the RNA-seq data. And we can see that two, the first two introns are confirmed and match with the data, but the third one is, is um, not synchronized. Okay, so potentially this is a change to this model. So we want to change the model, so we highlight the whole model and drag it up into the user-created area. Come on, you can do it. Okay, so sometimes uh, Apollo, if you have multiple windows open, loses its uh, right access uh, status, and so you just type, um, refresh the page, It should come back with exactly the same region and exactly the same evidence tracks and turned on. Like so. So this time I'm hoping that I do that and it works. Like so, excellent. So I'm gonna move in and highlight that region a bit closer. Turn up there. <coughs> Excuse me. Right, so. Our expectation here is that, that the, these uh, introns are correct, this one is incorrect, and we also can see that there's no UTRs currently predicted for this gene. So as stated, we, if you want to make a UTR, we would highlight this, this exon and then drag it to where we think it's an appropriate place. I'm, in this case, is doing UTRs really uh, qualitatively, just making sure that we have them rather than, than, than making sure that's the right place. So let's look at this potential change here. So the current prediction is in is, is this one here. You can see it has a very small intron, but that intron is still canonical, GT to AG. But the RNA-seq evidence, which is this brown uh, coverage plot, but also these predictions here, shows that it probably should be uh, a, a much larger, well, a larger intron, and we should truncate this exon. So to do this, we highlight the exon, we again navigate till we get to the edge, so you get that little arrow, like so. Click and drag. We drag it back until it's the place where we expect to be in alignment with the RNA-seq and has a canonical boundary, so GT. So you can do that manually, like I just did. Um, so you should also note that we, you can um, you can undo things. So if you make a mistake, you can always press undo. It should undo your change, like so. Another way of, of making that change without having to, to worry about the boundary is I can highlight the exon, find little arrow, go back further than where the splice site actually is, and then use this feature inside of the UTRs. So I can click on that. And highlight that by merging that into the prediction. So and then we get exactly the same boundary again with the right um, coordinates. So zoom out. Again, we can see here there's probably some UTR. So I would highlight the exon, find little arrow, and move the UTR out somewhere. Okay.
So that's that's how you would go about making this change inside of Apollo. This is this is a, a real change. So we would leave that here. I probably would um, want to have uh, the ability inside of the information editor to say that I've finished this um, prediction. Is something that we'll we'll move back to to actually how how you can change statuses. Um, and there are potentially here you can see there are other places where there are prediction changes that we could be looking at try and identify um, changes to those models. Okay. So last thing. So that's that's about the browser. That's about changes you want to do. What are the next steps? Um, next steps for us are to improve the evidence tracks. So to give clearer labels and track names, um, potentially to aggregate the RNA seq data. Uh, so it's very clear for if you're looking at things like Anopheles Gambi, there's far too many tracks here to know which ones you might have coverage for. If you aggregate that together, this is a, a, an old uh, instance, this is the BRC3 instance. So rather than have those 770 different uh, evidence tracks, we've merged them into a single one. So you can see now that this gives you more data and you have more, more, more surety that you might find the, the information you need rather than have to work out which one to turn on or off. Um, we also have labels here so you can see the, the frequency counts for those introns. Um, additional data types that currently aren't configured but are available inside of JBrowse in, in ViewPathDB. So there are data sets for transcriptional start sites or, or DNAs1 or chromatin binding, et cetera, that will be made available and might be useful to people. Uh, status tracking, that is uh, when you've finished a, a, a prediction and you're happy with what it is, you want to have a, pl a place where you can say, yes, I'm done, and only finished annotations will go back to be presented on the Juno browser. Only finished annotations will be uh, go forward to be processed to make a new reference set. Um, and then for the functional annotation, most of the, of the system is in place, but we need to develop best practices. Um, and that's, again, something that we'll be working on over the next few weeks, months, and there will be a webinar for that once it's released. Um, and then beta release so that you guys can actually get access to all of these um, tools and start working and uh, making changes. Thank you. Um, that's all I have, Omar. Any questions? Great. Yeah, great. Thanks, uh, Dan. That was very nice. And uh, like you said, um, I think we're really all excited about our uh, beta sites, which are uh, pretty much done. And we're, we're just waiting for uh, some approval so we can uh, make sure we can make them available to you and, and you'll have access to all these amazing tools. Uh, one additional question that came up is whether um, uh, these Apollo, uh, any changes are available to uh, everybody and the answer obviously is yes, if you're using Apollo you see them, but uh, more specifically if somebody goes to a gene page in ViewPathDB and the gene has a change in Apollo, will we have a way to indicate that uh, this gene has been modified or will we show an Apollo track there, for example? Uh, and so those are kind of the types of where this question is going, I guess. So the, the idea in the first instance is that we would uh, have a track in the, the JBrowse in the Genome Browser. So you could see um, any, any model that has been changed and has been signed off. So that status field, if it's turned on, then those genes will appear in the Genome Browser as a track. Um, beyond that, I mean, I think that there's, you know, there's the possibility of having a flag in the gene page to say, you know, there's, there's an update here. People have, you, that has been done previously uh, in UPATH for annotations from GeneDB. I think that's a, that's a possibility. But the, the, at the moment, the, the plan is that there will be a track for updated gene models in JBrowse. And that, of course, will appear um, or will be configured to appear inside of the uh, this panel here, the first gene model panel of the gene page. Great, thanks. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's a, that's actually a quite a nice suggestion to have some kind of a flag. And obviously, um, it just brings me to another point that we always are excited and, and uh, love to hear from our users about suggestions and ideas about how to improve things. So uh, definitely click on the Contact Us link on all of our uh, website pages. Uh, it's available at the top of our website pages and let us know your ideas or your suggestions. Those are always much appreciated and we, we take them to heart and try and, and see if we can address them and, and make our sites uh, more useful to you. Um, 
All right, thank you, uh, Dan. Um, any other questions? So I did uh, fail to mention in the beginning that uh, in answering questions, we were assisted by a couple of people on the call. In particular, I'd give a shout out to uh, Dave Starnes, who's based at the University of Liverpool, uh, but also on the call are uh, Evelina Bashenko, uh, Liverpool, and Gloria Giraldo Calderon, uh, who's based in Colombia. Uh, all of us were uh, looking at the questions and answering them as they were going on. Um, I'll, so let's give people maybe one more minute or so to um, answer questions and I will, what I'm going to do is just show my um, slide again or my, my page again um, and I want to point out that we do have a survey for uh, all of our webinars and so for this webinar in particular here's a link to the survey. I will uh, also put this in the chat box so you see it. But if you can, uh, please go ahead and uh, scan this or, uh, or go to the URL uh, right now. Uh, because as we know from experience, uh, if you don't do it now, uh, you are very unlikely to do it later on. <laughs> so uh, the link is now in the chat. Um, or feel free to scan uh, this window, uh, this uh, QR code on the screen, uh, and give us your feedback. We, uh, it's, it's been so far the feedback from all of our webinars has been very valuable. It's helping us. Uh, determine which other webinars to hold uh, in the future uh, and also gives us suggestions on uh, other things to improve. Uh, and as I indicated, we do have uh, future webinars scheduled for the next uh, few weeks and uh, and some of those are based on suggestions from, um, from you, from people who responded to our surveys. Uh, do we have any other questions? So, so my stuff would say that, that we obviously will be moving over um, tutorials and, and you know, uh, worked examples of, of annotation in Apollo from the BRC3 to BRC4. But there's also uh, quite a wealth of information out there about just, you know, generic how to use Apollo from other uh, resources that use it, such as i5K, but also from the Gmod itself. So, uh, you know, a Google search will find you lots of things about the, you know, navigation, how to make models, how to change models, um, and much of what we'll be producing in the next few months are more focused on how that works in, in our particular instance and what the expectations are in terms of merging or splitting predictions or, or naming things. Yeah, good point, uh, Dan. Definitely. Yeah. Okay, it looks like we've uh, approached the end of the questions. Uh, there's some thank yous in there for, for a nice presentation. So thank you, Dan, again. And as I mentioned, we will this webinar has been recorded. Uh, you'll get a link to the webinar and we will post it on our webinar page as well. Uh, thank you everybody very much for attending and uh, see you online soon again. Bye-bye.